Yes, and it's my pleasure today to do uh, definitely have another Small Biz Big Voices. But the difference is, <laughs> it's not the young lady that's hosting this time. It is me because it's a special. And every now and again, what we do with our guests on the various shows on uh, Tucson Business Radio Network is to point the finger back at them and uh, have a look why and how they're successful and try and find out what makes them tick. And, of course, the show, Tucson Means Business, uh, is always on uh, on our network, and that's uh, coming up this week. But you know and you've heard of, surely, Small Biz Big Voices. Well, the lady that hosts us is a business coach and author, Stephanie Rising, and she's helped over 100 small business owners achieve greater proficiency, profitability, and sanity. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Well, her regular podcast, Small Business, Big Voices, is heard monthly right here on the Tucson Business Radio X Network. And with special guests, all sorts of lovely people and bubbly interview style, she's gathered a loyal tribe following her coaching gift. So welcome, Stephanie. Well, thank you. It's very weird to be on the receiving end of the questions today. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> the other side, I tell you what. Well, you, you specialize in navigating the complexities of family-owned companies mm -hmm. and partnerships. Well, I think it's, what, five to about 25 employees, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Does this represent a, a certain dynamic of business, these chosen numbers, or is there another reason behind that? Well, I, I picked that particular demographic because for a couple of reasons um the first is is that i think there are a lot of small business companies uh, that feel like they don't have the resources to afford coaching uh, maybe they've been part of programs in the past that came with a really big price tag and they got some sticker shock uh, or they know of other people who engaged a coach or a consultant and, and they just felt that it was something that was beyond uh, their means. And that's not the case. Hmm. Um, I really want small business owners to know that there are resources in the community that can help them to grow their business and become more profitable and to be more fun. And that's something that I'm really passionate about. Well, you're regarded as an expert small business advocate. I mean, did you have a uh, specific background in, in this arena? I do. I actually, when I finished at the U of A, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go to law school. And I was, uh, I was a little burned out at that <laughs> point. So I wanted to take a break, um, decide if law school was really the direction I was going to go in. And I wound up answering an ad and it turned into a 10-year career. And I worked for a parent company that had four divisions. And mm -hmm. I was peripherally involved in all four, but I was primarily involved in community association management. And the company that I worked for, we were at the time um, about a $3 million company, and I supervised 20 employees. Um, I started out as an assistant project manager, then I was a project manager, then I was GM and director of marketing. And so I held a lot of different positions, but I was always involved in some form of strategy, mm -hmm. who we were competing against, how we were going to gain market share, how we were going to brand ourselves, um, the interviewing process, mentoring employees, um, firing them if needed. Mm -hmm. um, how were we going to write correspondence in a way that was an extension of our brand? I mean, it, it really touched on every aspect of, of the business. And when I decided to leave the company, um, I had helped the owner position the business for sale. It sold. I stayed a year to transition the new owners. I knew I didn't want to be in that industry anymore, but I really loved helping a business to transform and grow. So this is what sort of woke you up inside. This that, is a track that you wanted, you thought, well, I, I love doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and you know. I and I felt like I had a very flexible skill set. And again, it was I was there for 10 years mm -hmm. in the guts of a small business uh, that had a a big impact on its clients and there were also various family members who were involved. And so I felt that entire dynamic was really fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Um and 
So when I went out on my own as a coach, I mentored for four years with a coach's coach and got deeper into behavioral analysis Mm. and performance benchmarking. And he really helped me put structure around the things that I had been doing um, very intuitively for the for those 10 years. Sounds pretty good. I mean, you know, we're going to talk a lot about this coach business later on because Mm -hmm. it seems that today every Tom, Dick and Harry out there is being a coach, but Mm -hmm. there's coaches and coaches. Yes. You know what I mean? And and there's a lot. Now, objective problem solving is something you specialize in, right? Mm -hmm. And you you have to make uh, your clients accountable. Mm -hmm. And in doing this, uh, you've represented a total of over $60 million in annual revenues, along with 1,000 employees. Mm -hmm. That seems like an enormous amount of work. The work, I I really give so much credit to my clients. They have to do the heavy lifting. I mean, I really think to be a small business owner uh, takes bravery. It is not easy to put your personal finances on the line. Sometimes you're putting your personal relationships on the line. Mm -hmm. Um, You're trying to create employment opportunities for other people. Uh, You're managing your reputation. There, there's just, you're always juggling as a small business owner, always. And it's, it's a very like personal high stakes poker round that you're walking into every single day. And, uh, so, I mean, I love what I do, and so maybe that's why it doesn't feel like hard work to me, because I have such a passion for it, and I really feel that this is my calling, and I've been doing it for the last 13 years. Uh, I really feel that the hard work and the, and the kudos is very much, um, very much should be attributed to my clients. Mm. Well, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time and effort and, and, and I, I would imagine there'd be some fascinating stories in there as well. <laughs> Let's there, talk about there your are, book. but I have to protect <laughs> the innocent. <laughs> All righty. Now, you're multi-skilled. I mean, you're a writer as well. Tell us about your book. It's available on Amazon. And the biggest thing is, why did you write it? And it's not about making money with it, surely. No, it was another thing that I, I just really felt called to do. Um, I wrote the book because I, I wanted there to be another accessible resource out there to business owners. And one of the, one of the very consistent fears that I kept bumping up against as a, a coach with my clients is people were, they're genuinely freaked out about sales and marketing. I mean, some people are, are naturally very comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But not the majority. Uh, the majority feel um, they're uncomfortable with it because they have kind of that used car salesman boogeyman in their head. Okay. And they think that sales... That everything's got to be like that. Yeah. Right. That it Which has it to be something slimy. Now, I need, I need, need to say right here, too, to explain sure. a little bit to the listeners that uh, the book is all very well, but it's based on DISC, D-I-S-C. Mm-hmm. Now, leverage your nature and increase your sales. Right. D-I-S-C is what now? So it is, the DISC is a behavioral assessment, and the DISC is, I call it director, influencer, supporter, and contemplator. And it's not a personality test. It is a behavioral assessment. Mm -hmm. So you answer a variety of questions, and it gives you a lot of insight into how you approach tasks and people in two different ways. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I wrote the book was to help any behavioral type figure out how they could more comfortably represent their company in a sales and marketing situation. So they know what their gifts are, they know what their challenges are, and they also have suggestions for how to represent their business in a way that's going to be more sustainable Mm -hmm. to them. And particularly, I think, um, introverted business owners, um, we often do a disservice to them. Yeah, very much so. You know, because sales and marketing is is geared toward the extroverted American. And there are plenty of introverts out there who are running companies who have a tremendous amount to offer. Mm -hmm. But the advice given to them about how to represent their company is is very skewed to one perspective. And so I wanted to write the book as a more all-inclusive way 
to um, approach that aspect of owning a business? Mm. Well, you know, I, I can remember oh, a few years back now, but because I've worked for myself for so long, but um, every time I was asked to fill in one of those darn, uh, you know, test <laughs> things, application thing, I'd make me sick. It really would <laughs> because they, they, they don't know me. Yeah. And I don't, give, I don't give a damn what answers you give. Yeah. They don't know if I can do the job or not. Mm-hmm. It's put together by academics. And half the academics I've ever met can't, you know, wouldn't be able to sell you a, a pot of tea. Well, it's funny. This test was actually originated by William Moulton Marsden back in the 1930s. And he was a Harvard psychologist. He was more interested in the behavior of, quote unquote, the normal population. Mm-hmm. than he was an abnormal psychology. And, and this was something that I um, touched on in my podcast with Jamie Vink a couple of weeks ago. And so the the purpose of it, and whenever I give anyone the DISC assessment, I I really make sure to tell them, we're not giving this to you to pigeonhole you or because we think that we know you. It's your self-assessment of how you approach different situations. Well, that's better. And, and everyone right. possesses all of these qualities, but we all have kind of these default modes that we slip into. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that I've ever done a disc debrief with someone. A disc where, debrief, a, right? a debrief <laughs> where what I'm, what I'm saying to them is revolutionary. I think the power of it is that we have this sense of what we like or don't like, or maybe why we, why we like it, why we don't like it. But to consciously articulate it is very powerful because then we can catch ourselves when we're like in these moments where maybe we're struggling with something and we're not sure why, and we're trying to force the solution. Mm -hmm. And if we're conscious of the fact that, you know, I'm not really naturally wired to embrace that particular activity that makes sense. or that task, mm-hmm. then they can, shouldn't be doing it. Yeah, they, they shouldn't be You're doing it. You're not going to give your heart and soul, it. are you? you right, know. right. And there is such a thing as getting older and growing out of it and people change, things change. But yeah, you know, I mean, you outline step-by-step tactics for building a marketing plan, mm-hmm. uh, sustainable for each uh, reader's personality mm-hmm. and that speaks to their specific target market. Mm-hmm. Now, apparently... Um, you have led numerous well-received workshops on this uh, DISC-based marketing mm-hmm. and uh, applying behavioral analysis in business. Why do you think that is? I mean, is it, is it the thing of today? Is it the in thing? I don't know if it's the in thing so much as, I, you know, this goes back to Hippocrates. I think people are inherently interested in what makes other people Tick. Tick. <laughs> and and we we are by nature social creatures, which means having a sense of connectedness to others. Well, is this is really evident today to with, with the darn Facebook and yeah. uh, and communications. I mean, I've never seen this is like an industrial revolution, only it's to do with uh, high tech. And I've mm-hmm. never seen so many human beings um, non communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, spend all their time with their head in this little screen, mm-hmm. walking across the road, driving, you name it, <laughs> s- sitting in front of television. Um, it's horrendous. And I don't know if there's a connection between you and I, or between misery and all that's going on and God knows what, but uh, I, knew, I do know that it's causing divorces in uh, some cases. Really? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, you think about it. But the women will tell you, from what I, when I do my research and the people I've interviewed, they will tell you, well, my marriage is so boring, I've got to do something. And my friends are all over the world. My friends are, are um, you know, in different places. I can, two seconds, I can speak with them, talk with them, see them. Mm-hmm. This is the beauty of what we never had before. Mm-hmm. You'd have to sit down and write a letter, for God's sake, or you'd have to pick up the phone. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to call. Mm-hmm. But this is like finger movement, and you're there with them, wherever they are, what they're doing. And I just think there's a hell of a lot more sharing going on than there would be normally. Yes. You know? I, there but are a it's lot of changing I've personalities. With. It's, it's, it's making people introverted. 
Um, I don't know if it makes us more introverted. I mean, I'd be really curious to go back and look at various forms of of communication over time mm-hmm. and what the arguments were made at each step. It seems like every generation has some sort of a struggle with <laughs> tech, so whatever the technology du jour is, mm. right? There are people who are early adopters. They really embrace it. They make it part of their daily lives. And there are people who uh, have a lot of anxiety around it. And I mean, I'll be the first mm. to admit that I think that um, social media has plenty of negative unintended consequences, but I I do think that it's really fascinating how easy it is to share information, to feel more deeply connected. I could understand it for those that are lonely, for those living by themselves. Uh, What a wonderful outlet to be able to be involved in groups or this and that and chat. Mm -hmm. Um, But to share every bit of your life, maybe, you know, and I realize that I realize that you can only share with those you choose to share. It's, It's not like it's open to the world, but it, the same token, everybody knows your business. Yeah. Where you're going, what you're doing, um, where you're going to be at when you're away. I mean, and if you're a hacker, I mean, you know. And I think that's a, it's that's generational. That's a dangerous part. Well, there you go. Let's get on to something about travel sure. because you, you've done an enormous a lot to help people. How did you get involved with promoting and uh, educated, healthy community in the Lusaka, Zambia region? What was that all about? Uh, yes. Actually, I would love to have my friend Bevan on the show. Uh, my friend Bevan Dunn is an incredibly talented photographer. And she and a couple of girlfriends went over to Zambia. I forget how many years ago this was. And they were very, uh, they were very affected by the the poverty that they saw mm-hmm. and the lack of educational opportunities for right. kids. And so they decided on that trip that they were going to form a foundation to raise money to build a school because there were so many children who had been orphaned, um, particularly by the AIDS epidemic in mm-hmm. that country. It was pretty bad then. Yes, very. A poor lot of little children are left by themselves. It's, yeah, very yeah. hard. It, and she has some of the most beautiful photographs of the children over there. And um, she tells the story much better than I do, and it's it's very affecting. Now, that we're talking about the Tamwani Children's Foundation. The Tamwani Children's, Children's Foundation. Foundation, right. So I learned Because you're, you're a monthly sponsor, her. right, of Youth on Their Own, mm-hmm. right, which provides stipend supplies mm-hmm. and mentorship uh, to Tucson teens yes. who are homeless mm-hmm. through no fault of their own. Right. So, you know, here's this one millions of miles away, and you support the Tamwani Children. A little bit different there for these poor devils than what it is even in Tucson. Yes. Right. It's, it's amazing how a small donation for an African child can mm-hmm. transform if it gets to them their it, day. It yes. gets to them. That's yes. the biggest thing, isn't it? So that's wonderful. And that's food, education, yes. uh, hope for orphaned children impoverished by the effects of HIV AIDS in mm-hmm. Lusaka, Zambia, yes. in Africa. So you got into this. Mm-hmm. I, I got into it because I think, I think that everyone wants to feel like they're in a position where they can affect some sort of change. And I, I don't discount small cumulative effects. And so there, I can't single-handedly eradicate poverty, um, but I can donate to organizations that are focused on education. Mm-hmm. And I think education is the root um, uh, in terms of trying to disrupt the cycle of poverty. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, well, the broadening of the mind. Yes. Learning. I mean, it's wonderful to see doctors, scientists, um, uh, academics come out of worlds like that mm-hmm. who have studied hard, been somehow given a scholarship. Yes. Or given a chance to just better themselves, you know, and get to the States or get to Britain. Yes. And later on, they've become the leaders and gone back to these countries uh, and doing so much that they can to. I mean, look at look at the, the the recent outbreak of Ebola again. 
Yeah. I mean, uh, these countries, it's so heartbreaking. You see the famines, the food that we send, which upsets me, which doesn't even get there sometimes mm. through, through the baddies, you know, mm. yeah. the, the groups who, who, who hold that for ransom. Uh, that's that's uh, that's where sometimes I feel like you know sending the Marines, the good old Marines, well sending everybody we got because it's not uh, it's not fair. You're sharing with Stephanie Rising, who hosts her regular monthly podcast, Small Biz, Big Voices. It's right here on Tucson Business Radio Network. But for today, though, it's an inside uh, Temple special look at the host, Stephanie Rising. And please remember that show notes, interview questions, and additional coaching tips can be found on her wonderful Small Biz Big Voices Facebook page. All right? Facebook, correct, Steph? Yes. yes. All righty. The That's dastardly good. Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> the dastardly <laughs> Facebook, right. When we say, look, there's social media and social media, you know, um, I'm glad this business has stopped, you know, after this sh uh, another shocking uh, yeah. a shooting deal. And um, of those poor parents and, and, and relatives, I mean, the shock is amazing. Uh, until it is, you know, close to home, you don't, sometimes you just don't feel it. Mm -hmm. But the reality is um, changes have to be made once yeah. and for all instead of talk and just prayers. Yes. Changes have to be made. Very much agree. And, uh, you know, so... You do executive team coaching. Give me an idea of what Stephanie Rising does. If you were going to coach me and I wanted to hire you, I'm a small business guy. Mm -hmm. I'm a small business operator, uh, five or less staff. That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I need help, trust me. Um, what would you do to help me in my world and in my business? Give me an, give me an example. So when I'm... If I'm uh, understanding the a, disc thing, that's a different thing again. Sure. All right. So are we talking sole proprietor or someone who has employees? No, 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 a sole proprietor. Sole proprietor. In this particular case, because you okay. wouldn't get many of them, though, would you? Or do you? Uh, I work a lot with both. I have people who come to me and it's just them. They have no employees, but they mm. want to grow their business and their business model is such that uh, they, they have that capacity. Um, you'd be surprised how much business one person can conduct. And that's not to say that they don't have help. Maybe they have a virtual assistant or they have a bookkeeper, but most of the work is, is done by the one person. Um, and so often sole proprietors will come to me because they, they want to find more capacity in themselves, or they've had a business for a, a while and they're looking to kind of rebrand and transform what they're about. They really want to take it up a notch. Um, so we look at what they're, what they have going on at a foundational level. And then we figure out, well, what does that notch look like? Where are they at now versus where do they want to be? What does, what does that gap look like? Uh, what has to be done to overcome that gap? I work with them a lot on um, systematizing their business so they're spending less time on administration and more time on revenue producing work. Um, I'm working with them on evaluating who they're marketing to, what kind of messaging they're using, whether they're adequately communicating their value. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of us undersell ourselves because we just want to be of service to others. And also we've been doing what we've, what we do for so long, we start to take ourselves for granted. So I think one of the things that I do with small business owners and, and the sole proprietors in particular is help them to step back and realize what their contribution really is and how to communicate that and charge for it. For small business owners who have staff um, and they're looking at becoming a $1 million or $2 million business, like the first million is the hardest mark to hit. Right. And then doubling from, from there is another major milestone. So looking at their operations, how they're utilizing technology, um, looking at what their net profit is and what is affecting their net profit number, um, 
we look at all of that. And also, I think one of the main things that I do with companies, with employees, is help them to develop a core executive team. Because the, the most common thing that I see with a small business owner who has been doing what they're doing for a while, and they have brought staff on, is they still hold their whole business in their head. They know their goals, they know their financials, they have their own vision, but they don't really communicate that to other people. And so their employees wind up with a real lack of context. And then the employer winds up feeling like their employees have no judgment and they can't delegate to their employees. When very often, unintentionally, they're kind of the culprit in that. Mm. And so getting them to understand how to split up the day-to-day responsibilities of running their business among a trusted team so that they're freed up to focus on growth, on relationship development, on getting the resources like financing for the business that will fund the growth. Um, When they reach that point, they see a huge difference, not only in their revenues, but also just in their stress level. Mm. And uh, that's very interesting transformational work. Do do you think it's it's difficult for a a one-off business person to let go? Yes. You know, to uh, be at staff number one, number two, whatever, you know, I mean, uh, I guess they've sort of done it all alone and and, uh, all along, haven't they? They have. And I I think for a sole proprietor, it's twofold. They're used to doing everything themselves. And it's very difficult to make that jump to invest trust in someone else to represent them and their brand and their mission. That's a that right there is a big adjustment. And the other is uh, being able to afford the help. Mm. Um, But there are things that you can do in terms of financial benchmarking, um, setting sales goals. So when you reach a certain revenue point, okay, bring somebody in 15 hours a week. Then when you reach the next revenue point, bring them on for 30 hours a week. When you reach the next one, you could bring them in full time and, okay. you know, steps. So yeah. do it in steps. Um, and there are other options, again, like virtual assistants or just outsourcing your bookkeeping or there are ways of getting things off your plate. I'm a sole proprietor um, and I have people available who help me on a, a project basis mm-hmm. so that I'm doing the least amount of administration as possible and the most client care as possible. Hmm. It's... Um... 2006, what is it now? 2019, right? Mm-hmm. That's 13 odd years. Mm-hmm. How did you, well, we've talked about really how you got into it, but after 13 years, mm-hmm. what do you think has kept you going? I mean, you seem to be still, you know, full of zest. I mean, it's like you're on a mission. I am very much on a mission and I, I just cannot get the statistic out of my head and it, I'm actually still surprised how much it drives me. Um, When I was going through my training to become a coach after I I left my corporate job, um, I found out that the average American, and this was back in 2006, Mm -hmm. the average American was spending 100,000 hours of their life on the job. And I certainly had experienced my own fair share of stress up to that point in my life Mm -hmm. um, with work and had, you know, had done the, the crazy hours and the crazy amount of responsibility. And, you know, you have to, you're always trying to prove to clients your value so that you can get (laughs) your tiny raise every year. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that hundred thousand hours just represents a tremendous opportunity that could go either way. Um, I think some people really embrace it as an opportunity to learn and to stretch and to explore and discover. And it's, it's very fulfilling. 
But I think for a lot of Americans and a lot of small business owners in particular, that's that's a big chunk of your t- life that's really spent in stress. Well, it is. Right. It is. Instead of working for somebody, you choose to go it alone and do your own thing. I mean, you choose it, but it affects everybody else around you. It it does. And I I specifically picked small business because... I wanted to help improve the quality of life for small business owners. I, I wanted them to be able to spend time with their families. I want them to be able to go to their kid's dance recital or their baseball game. I want them to be able to send their kids to college. Basically, I want them to well, be able nice to have thoughts, a decent life. But, but why? You're in business. You've got to make money, haven't you? Well, I don't think being in business is only about the money i think i think that's one of the things that is like a byproduct of being in business but the the people i know who are the most successful and who ironically make the most money mm-hmm. are the ones who have a really personal reason for why they do what they do and what it is that they're trying to contribute to their community. I and, agree with you implicitly. Yeah. Oh, and, and, you, I, and, I, I and you you're, you're winking at me. <laughs> I asked you that specifically because, you know, um, there are a lot of people in small business uh, that shouldn't be in small business. They are only there for the money and it's what yeah. drives them. Yes. And there's a core value missing. There's something yeah. deep down, you know. What do you think uh, you know, as as a, as a business coach extraordinaire, what do you think is the number one problem that you have to solve as a coach? I have to get people past their sense of isolation. I think that's isolation is the number one problem. I think that I that I solve in terms of when I'm starting to work with someone. By the time someone is meeting with me um, for for the very first time, Mm -hmm. um, they don't know me at all. And I try and and put them at ease as as quickly as possible. And I really can't think of a time when someone didn't just start to spill their guts, uh, like within five minutes of meeting me, because they've kept so much on their shoulders and so much inside. Right. Uh, they know, just poured it out. They, huh? ju- they, they just really need someone to talk to. And, right. you know, I, I mean, I can't, um, I am not a therapist and I never misrepresent myself that way. But I do joke that part of what I do is almost like business therapy, because if if you're freaked out about whether you can afford to keep your doors open, Mm -hmm. who are you going to talk to? You don't want to jeopardize your reputation in the community while you're trying to turn things around. You don't want to instill any fear in your employees. Your spouse, if they've never owned their own business or been like a C-suite professional, they don't know what it feels like to try and make payroll. So who do you talk to? That's it. That's why a lot of business people, I think, drink, quite frankly. Yeah. And they go to uh, little watering holes on the way home just to be able to chill out and and think about things and, you know, let things go down. Yeah. How does a coach differ from a consultant? I think a a coach differs from a consultant. Um, Consultants tend to come into a business they evaluate what is going on with that business. They analyze the information and they provide the client with a report that the client can then uh, use to make decisions. And, and there is a lot of value in that. Mm-hmm. I really love being a coach because I want to ride the ride with you and I'm not going to... Their success is your success type Their thing. success is my success. So you get a buzz out of that. I, I do. And and I also think that there, there are a lot of advantages to people, like maybe the behavioral types who are, they're more social. 
they need someone in their sandbox that they can trust, that they can bounce things off of, <laughs> right? And Sandbox. And, I haven't heard that one in a while. <laughs> I want to play with you. I, I'm the kind of person. I need playmates. I, I have people yeah, I mean, right, I, I can't that, that I can talk to. Too much, I <laughs> think, you know? yeah. So I, I think that that's a huge advantage, that you have someone mm-hmm. that you can talk to who has walked in your shoes. I I have sweat payroll. I have had to fire people. I have survived Mm -hmm. an embezzlement. I mean, not me personally, but the company that I worked for. Yeah, I understand. I went through all of those things. And was there ever a time though you thought, oh, to heck with it, it's just not worth it? I can't take this anymore. I don't need it anymore. As a coach? As a business person. You're wearing different hats here. I mean, you have to be strong Superman, Iron Man, all in one for your clients. But who, who have you got? Oh, I have lots of people. Other than your darling hubby. Well, my husband, who I love very much. Yeah, he... but he must get sick of it sometimes. Oh, he never gets sick of it. <laughs> Every right. once in a while, maybe. So he he's a keeper then, okay. He's a keeper, but I have... But does the coach have a coach? I have had a coach the entire time I've been in practice. And that is, uh, may I ask, is female, male? I, I've had a lot of different coaches, okay. actually. Um, and the I, reason I ask that sure. is not to be sexist. It's to try and get a perspective on does a female coach necessarily go to a female coach or does a male only go to a male? You know what I mean? I, oh, I, I don't have a coach. Oh, no, I've, I've worked Yet. with men, <laughs> women. Um, I personally, half my clientele are women and half my clientele are men Interesting. for me personally okay. yeah. I've worked with men and women coaches and I've kind of tr- gravitated toward people who have their own little niche mm-hmm. and I stay with their program for you know two or three years I get as much information as possible from them I learn as much as I can and then I figure out what the next tool is that I'm trying to add to my toolbox, and mm-hmm. I will find a coach who specializes in that tool. I see. And so um, right now I have two coaches, actually, and one is a marketing coach and one is an executive coach who I get to go to and spill my guts out to. Very nice. Very good. Yeah, it well, helps a lot. If nothing else, I wouldn't mind one then because I can go spill my guts out to somebody. That would well, be great. gee, Mark, I think I know someone you could talk to. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too expensive, is she? No. <laughs> not right now, anyway. But, um, no, well, you know, I'm in the same sort of business. I'm in business to help people. I mm-hmm. really get a buzz out of that if mm-hmm. if they're successful. Yeah. And I've got clients now through, uh, through what we do that is rather unique, uh, you know, our podcasting world here in Tucson, and through uh, the Tucson Business Radio X Network. I've got clients now that are getting results and when they're ringing me up at nearly midnight, it's exciting to tell me that they've just got another new client and another new client, you know what I mean, yeah. uh, faster than they've ever got clients before in a different way. Yeah. And without having to go and get booze at some mixer that they had to go to, they're very excited. So yeah. I do get a buzz out of that. Yeah. And uh, uh, I enjoy teaching. I mean, I was in the media industry for over 40 years. Really? And uh, I had radio and television background and... To retire, which I should be at my age, to retire is just not on. I need to do something. Yeah. And one gets very bored with golf seven days a week. <laughs> um, and it just doesn't do anything for the brain, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so I, do. I had to get back into something. And uh, after leaving KVOI um, on a full time basis, which was absolutely demanding terribly for the hours of what I was doing on a talkback show. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, this is enough, but at least. I have clients who are growing, they're building their businesses, and I hope to get a lot more over the next 12 months. But it takes time and branding, as you're aware, Mm -hmm. and it takes time for that word to get out, just how successful this can be for people. Yes. Um, Because they've got to get their head around it. It's quite unique, you know. So anyway, yeah, so uh, very interesting. And, And you've got a hobby, but you've got two coaches. I do. Who teach you what then? Well... I work with my marketing coach. One thing that is very outside my my bailiwick is um, online marketing. I well, it's it's outside I, most people. Well, yeah, it's still except, relatively new, you know. I mean, I know everybody's throwing the yellow pages out the door, but well, millennials are so comfortable with online marketing because they've they've never well, they lived grew up in with a, it. a non-digital world. They right. grew up with it. I didn't even grow up with a computer in school. Never knew yeah. what one was. Yeah. These kids are lucky. By the time they're 10, 11, 12, they're very au fait. 
with being online. Mm -hmm. They can do wonderful stuff. Now they can learn all different sorts of software. Mm -hmm. Next minute they can, you know, design and do this and do that. What a wonderful world. Mugs like us always have to go to somebody. And and, and if they don't rip you off, they'll drive you nuts because they don't see your vision. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, we have it harder. There's no doubt about it. Well, and I think growing up in Tucson, I mean, I've lived here since I was six. Tucson's a very relationship-driven town. And so all of the marketing that I have ever done Mm -hmm. has been face-to-face. It seems to be it's all who you know to a degree, Tucson, you know. But to go beyond Tucson, I mean, now with, like, with Zoom, I could coach anywhere this is Anyone, this is the anywhere. one big thing that I really do right. like about the high tech world. Right. Communication, teaching. You right. know, the, you know, they're doing operations now. You know, with doctors in different states, which is amazing through visual. Yeah. You know, online and, and the future of where it's going to go is is absolutely astronomical. But how to get to your audience through that through world, that medium? Yeah. Like, that's way. what I don't know how. to well, do. so getting help with there's that a lot is, of humpy dumpy on, you know, social media, this social media, that the truth of it, I'll tell you now. And I've been around uh, marketing and sales, you know, for many years now. And the one thing I have learned about this online jazz is that nothing is unique in its own perspective. It's all needs to be together. So right. social marketing is no good. Unless it's integrated. Unless it's integrated. Yeah. And there's a beginning to it and an end to it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. not the end all and be all. On its own. Mm -hmm. It has to be integrated with everything else. But the problem with this world today and doing all of this jazz, it makes us the single entrepreneur having to work longer and harder because we've got, if you can't afford to pay anybody or or not be as big as you'd like to be just yet, who does it all? Mm -hmm. You do. Mm -hmm. And you've got to do more with online than what we ever used to do before. And, and yeah. it, it gets added to it on top of everything else that we have to do. And that's, you know, when I feel like all I'm doing is adding to my plate instead of getting things off of my plate, that's mm-hmm. when I turn back to trying to walk my talk uh, and what I preach to my clients, which is what needs to be temporary because it's really not your wheelhouse and it's not how you should be spending your time. And once you identify that, what would it take to get it off of your plate? And I'm, I'm always surprised at how very <laughs> focused I get mm-hmm. once I have a game plan for how to get something mm-hmm. delegated. Once you, once you can get it done, right? Right. That, yeah, that new client good. that you've been putting off, picking up, all of a sudden you pick them up. Right. Right. Uh, what often comes up? the most do you think for people who are thinking about working with a coach, but they're still not quite sure if they need one? There's a few things. I think one thing that comes up is um, there are a few things that I hear. One is I know what I need to do. I just need to do it. Well, if it was that simple, you would have done it already. Right. Uh, The other thing I think people are very reluctant to air their dirty laundry Because if you're in a leadership position, you feel like you're in a position where you need to have all of the answers. And so if you're floundering, to confess that, you have to be comfortable being a little bit vulnerable. And not everyone is prepared to do that. Um, But it's very liberating when you are. Uh, Something else that... uh, that I hear a lot is that um, I should just be able to figure this out for myself. That's a, a big one. You know, I, I gave birth to this company. I know all of its nuts and bolts. There's this problem in front of me. I'm pretty sure I could just solve it if I sat down and gave it some thought. And the disadvantage to that is you're back in that isolationist mode where all you're hearing are your own thoughts echoing around and maybe your solutions are a little bit stale or they're, they're valid, but they're incomplete. And talking to someone else can, can broaden that perspective. And I think the, the biggest one that I run into is the assumption is, is that they can't afford a coach. Mm-hmm. 
if you have a million dollar business and you're trying to grow, I mean, just by way of example, my annual coaching fee is going to be about 1% of your gross revenues. Mm -hmm. And my whole objective is to more than pay for myself as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but a million dollar business turnover is a bit different to maybe a hundred grand turnover or 50,000 or even right. 10,000 turnover when you're first starting, you know? Yes. And that's, that's why this is why I would think most of them would be a little scary and say, well, I don't think I can afford you. Well, the, the micro businesses, I mean, I consider myself to be a micro business. I mean, there's just one of me. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, the whole time I've been in business, I've had a coach. And one of the ways that I do that is I will join mastermind groups. And so one of the programs that I'm looking to launch, um, actually this fall, is a mastermind group for the solopreneur. Okay, that and, sounds like a good and idea. And then it cuts my Do, do I have the half. correct understanding, though, of what I think that is, a mastermind group? This is like where there may be 10 or 12 of you, maybe more. Actually, I, I like small groups. You like small? Okay. Yeah. yeah, I like small too. Yeah. I'm shy. I go into a room, I just look for a corner. until I You? Don't. Yeah, believe it or not, on air is very different to being oneself. That is true. You know, it's, it's, that's just my business, you know, it's the way I am. Um, another reason I don't like mixes. Yeah. You know? Um, where were we? Oh, master. Master, master what mind. Um... Is it a case of being able to be in a group and then you all get to share what's bugging you or what the problems are right? so the, that you get different aspects, different views? Right. So, you know, when Is that the basics of the, that's, of the mastermind? That's the basic idea okay. because if all you're right. in business by yourself, it helps to leverage the experience of, of other people and especially sometimes in other industries. Um, what – what someone is doing in an industry that may not seem to relate to yours right. can give you a lot of ideas for how to approach yours in a more innovative way. So Interesting, isn't I, it? Because you would think, well, what, what the devil would they know about, you know, my business? Yeah. Because I'm not a clue about theirs, you know. Right. But you, but you do see things in a different perspective. Absolutely. I mean, I have a client um, who is a pest control company, and the way that they approach um, customer service and some of the things that they do with their business when we're talking about it in coaching, uh, I get ideas from my clients all the time hmm. about things that I could do, especially around um, service or uh, clients talk about um, apps that they use for various different things, software programs, um, and their industries have nothing to do with my industry, and I get ideas all the time. Very good. So there, if you're listening to that one, that's uh, that's a darn good idea. If that's the case, look for a master a tank type thing. All right. What advice do you have for someone who's looking for a business coach, especially if they've had experience like the one you've described, okay? Because we don't have a lot of time left, and I want, do want to ask you a couple of other things, but sure. briefly on that one. So uh, there's a, a little list of, of questions, so you can jot these down. So if you're interviewing a coach, you can ask them the exact same thing. Um, one, ask what kind of training they've received. The second is get a sense of whether they've experienced the things that you have faced. Um, like I said, with my background, I feel a great affinity for small business owners. If someone comes to me and their business is primarily built around government contracts, I have a colleague I refer them to because that is his niche. It's his specialty, and he's going to have a much greater sensitivity for your challenges than me, hmm. which leads me to make sure that they're putting your needs first. Like, do you get a sense that they can truly help you or they're just going to take you on and wing it. Um, definitely understand if they're going to lock you into a contract. See if they can give you examples of how they have advocated for their other clients. And the last is, you know, ask around a little bit and see if they have a reputation for guilt tripping clients who are getting ready to leave coaching. Um, Unfortunately, there, there are a few coaches out there who function this way. I think the overwhelming majority of coaches 
really have their clients' best interests at heart. Right, right. But as with any profession, there are a few bad eggs out there, and they they try and trap their clients um, and put in as minimal effort as possible in exchange for a check. I yep. don't think that that's the dominant uh, characteristic for our coaches here in Tucson, but you know there there are a few out there, and you just mm-hmm. need to be aware. Be aware and be careful. Yes. And, and ask the questions that Stephanie has just advised because you've got nothing to lose. Yes. You're going to find out because, I mean, you're not going to get it with this lady. She just won the Better Business Bureau's uh, Torch Award for Ethics. Do you mind? <laughs> Congrats on that. Well, well Thank done, Thank you honey. very much. Uh, what do you feel is an ethical issue that is facing the coaching industry today? I know you just mentioned, you know, there are some, it's every darn business in America. I don't know what it is. Some just don't want to do it the easy way, don't they? And they'll hurt yeah. others by doing so. Yeah. There's always some that got to spoil it for everybody, you know? Yes. I've never met so many crims in all my life. <laughs> I got to tell you, I do think I really want to emphasize, I think most coaches, the majority of coaches are very good at what they do and they really care about their clients. They put the heart and soul into it. Right. And Mm. so it comes down to, you know, who do you personally feel most comfortable with? Because if you're not comfortable with your coach and you don't trust your coach, there's no point in the relationship. But, um, I would say that the ethical challenge is, um, you know, I think that there are a lot of hobbyists out there. You know, this is not my hobby. This isn't I retired and then for 15 hours a week, I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I'm going to take on a client. Um, I go to conferences on coaching. I have coaching myself. I went through training. I'm 13 years into my practice. Um this I do not have a casual attitude. No, no, toward it's a this. full-on business for it, you. This is my profession. You, you, you treat it with respect. Yes. Implicitly. Yes. And, and you need to do that. Now, one of the things that you do offer as a coach um, is behavioral analysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is important to your clients. Why? Why do you think that is important? It's important. Um, I've received so much feedback over the years of how how understanding behavioral analysis has really changed their ability to communicate with their staff, to, um, to better utilize the talents of their staff because they're, they can tweak the roles in such a way that they're really enabling somebody to flourish Mm -hmm. instead of kind of stick them in some role that's very antithetical to their nature, right? Not them. And, uh, but that brings it back to the having sure. the right person in the darn first place, though. You got to have the right person. You know what I mean? Right For what seat. you want and what you need versus uh, trying to convert someone into it. Right. I, I mean, don't don't put a shy person in a marketing role, mm-hmm. and don't put a marketing person in finance or in accounting and do collections. I, I mean, like you have yeah, right. you have to know who you're dealing with, and, yet and the you funny have to th- honor it. You know what makes me laugh, though, Stephanie. Honestly, in the world, it's all changed. Yes, I mean, look at it now, 2019, compared to 19, you know, 60s or 70s. Everybody hates sales. Everybody doesn't like salespeople. They run the other way. You know what? If there wasn't a sale made, nothing would happen. Well, everyone in, every in a company form is a salesperson. Of business, you know what I mean? Right. Ships wouldn't come in. Freight wouldn't be there. No one would eat. No one would drink. Nothing. Right. We'd all be just stagnant, standing there like robots if it, sales weren't made. It's the way you go about it. Mm-hmm. I think when, I think, and especially here in Tucson, again, we're so relationship oriented. I... I can smell a transactional person from a mile away. If you're just out to crank volume and make your number, I'm not interested in doing business with you. But people who are advocating for their clients, they're trying to improve the standard of their industry, they're really trying to make a contribution to the community, I'll be loyal to that person all day. Right. Um, so I do think that sales gets a, a bad rap because I, I wish we could actually replace the word sales yeah. with relationship and education mm-hmm. because that's really what it's about is getting people to understand what you do. And if they have a need for that, yeah. you know you're available. Well, there's nothing more frustrating, though, than knowing someone that has a need for it 
and a, and a woodwork for them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, they'd be so surprised, but right. have a negative outlook, close mind, mm-hmm. you know, regardless, and may assess you as a sales person, per se, which should have nothing to do with what the product will do for you. Yeah. You know, but again, it's the relationship. Yeah. Someone once said to me, oh, you'll, you'll never do well in Tucson with anything. And Phoenix, you've got to go to – why? Why? Well, unless you, uh, unless you walked down the hallway of the high school together when you were kids and bumped into each other or used to drop books with each other, you'll never get business. You know, that was said to me when I first came to six really? years ago. Yeah, and I said, oh, my God, it's not going to be like that, is it? Everybody knows everybody. Uh, I don't believe it's like that. I not don't think now. so either. You know, it does help if you grew up with somebody or played football with them or this or that, but it only might get you in the door. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the business. Right, and I think, I think Tucson, um, we have such a uh, – a transient population here. I mean, people are always coming here to retire. They come here to go to school. They relocate here from other parts of the country. Yeah, it's uh, got to change. For jobs. Yeah, it's got to so change. There's always an influx of new of yep. new people here. It's mm-hmm. not just a matter of like who you went to school with. Relationships do run very deep. More, more here. business, more growth. There are those who still don't want it to grow, don't want it to do this. Yeah. You can't rely on the people who hear the snowbirds. They're here, they have their coupons, they do this, they spend a bit and they go. You know, they live their own life. But the jobs, the permanent jobs, the children, the kids coming out of uni, the kids coming out of high school, they've got to stay here. They've got to work. You know, and I think they can't have, be leaving all the time. We have more of a of a permanent year round um population than we used to. When my family moved out here in 1980, right. you really felt it in the mm-hmm. summer. The town was the like a ghost bird. town, wasn't it? It, it was. <laughs> and it's not like that anymore. You could shoot a shotgun down it, as they say. <laughs> no one to get hurt. All right, listen, we're nearly out of time, Stephanie. Lovely Stephanie Rising. She has www.therisingeffect.com. It's a nice site. There's a lot on that. Then you've got LinkedIn.com and all, all of that you can read about you. Your Facebook is what? You can find The Rising Effect on Facebook, and you can also find Small Biz Big Voices on Facebook. And that's your wonderful podcast that is gathering momentum and traction, and you're gathering a lot of uh, what they call your tribe. Yes, I love this my industry. tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, loyal people who enjoy listening to you and learn from you and teach from you. Um, do we get a sneak preview of your next show? Do you have someone special lined up or do you want to keep that a surprise? Oh, I do. Actually, next month, the wildly talented and interesting Alexis Lopez will be on the show to talk about alternative medicine, ancient medicine. Ancient medicine. It's Mm -hmm. coming into the fore again. Yes. It's funny, isn't it? After all these years with Western medicine and no one listened to anything, now it's all CBD oils and everybody's raving about that. Mm -hmm. And what about all the other good natural healing stuff that's been out there for years? Right. You know, uh, well, maybe. She's going to talk to us about some very ancient plant medicine and, you know, some of the stigmas around plant medicine, how those stigmas came to be, Mm -hmm. how they compete or they're perceived to compete Mm -hmm. with pharmacological medicines. And it's uh, it's a really interesting topic and it's one that's really timely. So I'm I'm very excited she's going to be on the show. But is it a month away? It's It's less than that, isn't it? um, well, I don't know. Wait a month to hear you I again. I know. Well, we, it's Labor Day, so we're doing it the, oh, that's the right. Monday after Labor Day oh, is okay. when Alexis will be on. All righty. Okay, then that's great. Well, listen, get bigger, will you, so you can do two shows a month instead of one. Well, I'm working on it. You know, some companies do one a week. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? That huh? would be fun. I love doing this. All righty. These. Thank you so much. The inside track on Stephanie Rising. She's a lovely lady, a brilliant coach, and a lovely person to boot. So, Copper show it's on uh, facebook you can look her up okay and uh go to uh, our network of course www.tucsonbusinessradiox.com and you'll see all the various shows and the various hosts and you're going to see stephanie there with small biz but they've got big voices <laughs> you know because they are well they're the backbone of america aren't they yes they are when you think about that all righty. Thank you. Lovely having you. Thank you for taking the time out, Stephanie. It's been an honor. Thank you for interviewing me. I really appreciate it. 